Welcome everybody back from lunch. I hope you had a good lunch and a nice break. So we're in session three, support networks, programs, professors, and fellow students. And the chair of the program is Dr. Anthony Hassan, who's a clinical professor at the USC School of Social Work, serving as the inaugural director of the Center for Innovation and Research on Veterans and Military Families. A retired Air Force officer himself, he brings 25 years of experience in, in uh, military social work that's been instrumental in the growth of the school's military social work program, as well as community-based research on veterans, service members, and their families. Take it over. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, our panel today will surely keep you awake after lunch. Uh, don't worry about that. But uh, what we really are going to focus on today for you is this area of prevention, early intervention kind of strategies, community capacity building projects and ideas that really are designed to make sure we educate and train folks who can be first line helpers and leaders, peer to peer models, et cetera. So we really believe that what you'll hear today is, is making a difference on colleges' campuses. I've asked them to talk about some of their outcomes as well. So it's just not what we're doing, but what kind of impact are they having? So um, I'm sure you'll look forward to hearing from them. So I'd like to introduce all of them to you. I have two presenters and, and two commenters uh, to introduce. Uh, so first on my left, your right is Anna Aguayu Bryant. She's a doctoral candidate and currently the Student Health and Wellness Program Manager for all 23 CSU campuses as California State University campuses and the co-lead of the Cal Mesa grant, which she'll be talking about. Uh, to her left, your right, is Dr. Taisha Caldwell. She's the mental health program manager for, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Taisha Caldwell, the mental health program manager for the 10 University of California campuses and the co-lead for the Cal Mesa grant. Next to her, we have Vivia, Viviana Bonilla Lopez. She's a law student at NYU and co-founder of a program called Rethink Psychiatric Illness that she founded uh, at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And finally, uh, Daniel Ave Galeo, Galeo, I'm sorry, a three-time combat tour veteran from the United States Marine Corps who is now working on his master's degree in vocational rehabilitation counseling and currently the veterans program coordinator at the American River Community College. So these are my colleagues here today who will be sharing with you their wonderful programs and the impact they're having on college campuses across California and the United States. Anna. Before I get started, I just want to thank Robert and also Jay and Daniel because I know you will be hearing more of Daniel's um, story, but these are, you know, servicemen that have, you know, given up and they're here to share their testimony. So I just want to thank you on behalf of the CSU and the higher ed system for presenting and sharing your experiences with us. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, again, my name is Ana Guayo Bryant. Um, I'm here to talk about what we did as a system under the Cal Mesa grant. It was uh, through the Prop 63, which is the Mental Health Services Act here in California. Um, I'm really happy and excited that we have Ann Collentine. She's a project director for the entire state of California. <laughs> so she's here to support us, me and Taisha, and all the great work that happened um, amongst all the three higher ed systems. And we also have Miguel way in the back. <laughs> And um, here's, he's from the Each Mind Matters. And you might have seen these green ribbons, but this is what we as Californians adopted to represent mental health. So I encourage you before you leave to pick up a green ribbon, promote this green ribbon on your campuses, in your communities, because this is what we are adopting as a, as a state to represent mental health. And it has a little card that gives you more information. But if you have dealt with mental health disorders or any, you know, share your testimony because that's really what empowers people. So I encourage you again, um, they're outside. I know Ann has some at her table. So um, during the break, come and grab a green ribbon. And I already have mine. <laughs> Everywhere I go, I try to um, represent. So with that, I'm going to share um, about the Cal State system and how we in 
and put this program together under the Cal Mesa grant. So how do we put a plan together as a system? So there are pieces come together under training, social marketing, electronic resources, and data collection. So these are the areas that I will be covering with you. But before I get started, let me tell you a little bit about our system, the California State University system. There's 437,000 students in our system. There's 44,000 faculty and staff, and we are the largest system in the country. We have 23 campuses from Humboldt all the way to San Diego State. So that's what the CSU represents. And um, the three higher ed systems was not, which received funding from Cal Mesa. There's the community colleges. And how many are here from representing the community colleges? Great. And then we have Taisha will be presenting on the UC. But the three higher ed systems in California received funding in 2011. And the goal was to promote mental health at different levels. And now for the 23 campuses, every campus received funding to support this effort. So what I'm gonna share now is what we did as a part of the CSU, but this was a collaborative effort amongst all three higher ed systems here in the state of California. So for the CSU, we focus on training, the social marketing campaign, and electronic resources. Every campus received money, as I mentioned, and they were able to do programs at the campus level, and it varied from campus to campus. The impact of the work that we did, we reached 288,000 students, 642 students, faculty, and staff. So for two years under this grant, I would say we reached the majority of our students and our faculty through the work that was accomplished. When it came to trainings, we trained over 17,238 students, faculty, and staff. And that didn't just include within the CSU, we actually invited the community colleges, the, the UC, and local partners from the county and nonprofit organizations to support this work. So we wanted everyone trained. Um, we, one of our goals to m make it sustainable is that we wanted to have certified trainers. We knew the funding was going to go away. So what could we do as a system to sustain this effort? So what we did is we trained certified trainers. And we trained 141 individuals within the state of California. Another goal of us, we realized that faculty and staff need to be trained, but what about our law enforcement? So we um, wrote a grant, got the grant, thanks to Cal Mesa, and we focus on training our law enforcement. And this is a post class for our law enforcement, and actually this week we start our second round of training for law enforcement. Um, and I'll share briefly. Um, so 256 officers went through the training. And we're, oops. Okay, my clicker's not working. And for my visual folks, I just want to add some pictures of what we did. The last one, and if you could just see, um, that's actually the police trainings. Officers go into scenarios that feel really like life situations, and we train the officers, and these are being trained by officers, on how to de-escalate situations that arise when dealing with a student or someone from the community that is experiencing a mental health disorder. So hopefully our goal is for officers to learn how to de-escalate that situation and help that person seek services. I mentioned trainings, and this is something that I encourage you. If you're here from an organization that needs training, these are the trainings that are available, if you haven't heard of these before. Mental health first aid is very critical. This one, this training provides an array of different mental health disorders. So if you want to train, it's a full day training, it's an eight hour course, um, so you do have to make adjustments for scheduling, but let me share with you, our faculty and our staff that attend the mental health, they get a little bit of each segment and how to recognize. Um, the other one that we've offered is ASSIST, which is um, Applied Suicide Intervention Skills Training. 
This one is to help someone that's contemplating suicide and for them to consider, help them through a plan. So that's an eight hour training. The next one is question, persuade, and refer. This is a two hour training. So if you're trying to decide what kind of training can I provide to my staff or my faculty that might be limited for a two hour window, consider QPR. And then there's Cognito. If you have not heard about Cognito, it's an online um, training. So if you're in a remote campus, um, let me share that this is something that some of our campuses like Chico, like Humboldt, they adopted because they recognize that, you know what, we might not have too many trainers within our area, but we could offer Cognito. And then we offered again the IVST, which is the police training, active shooter, safe talk, the bystander training and threat assessment. These were the trainings that we offered. Um, before you leave, if you are interested to find out who is trained in California, that's something that we committed to do as part of our system. We went county by county and looked at who is a certified trainer by county. So if you are interested in finding out who's trained in assist and mental health or QPR, I would be happy to provide you with that list. And you could invite them to come to your campuses or your organizations so they could do these trainings for you. Um, you know, we've heard, of course, um, from our panelists, but when we had a the director of the veterans program at Channel Islands, and we asked them to role play um, in the assist uh, a veteran and how to talk to that veteran um, not to consider contemplating suicide. So this was from his um, personal experience after going through the assist training, and I felt it was so powerful because he actually felt like he was the student going through the emotions. So. Um, you do a lot of role playing, so it really, really helps even with faculty that you might not consider. Like at Sacramento State, we have a faculty from the science and the math going through assist training. So you, those are not your traditional class, you know, faculty that would probably participate in trainings, but it's happening within our system. Another thing that I would encourage you is that we um, had Student Health 101. It's an electronic magazine. I looked at everything that's offered in the US when it comes to resources, electronic resources, and I have to say that we were very pleased with Student Health 101. It is an expense, but it's great if you get other departments on your campus to contribute towards putting, um, purchasing this. They do have a parent edition, and let me just share, within the two years, we had 128,877 students who accessed Student Health 101. So students were reading the magazine, and there's so many articles in there that you know could reach the students that you might not be reaching. And the great thing about Student Health 101, if you wanna do any customizing, they actually allow for that. So if you are wanting to promote some of your activities, uh, services, Student Health 101 is a great organization to work with. And I, again, a lot of our students were reading the magazine. Also, we created an electronic database for faculty. And um, if you want, just give me your business card and I would be happy to provide you with the link. But the Merlot site is something like the um, Eric Clearinghouse but for the CSU, we have the Merlot site, and a faculty member from Humboldt went through and created this um, website, and it's open to anyone. It's available, and it's electronic resources. Things that were available that if you want any of these resources, we have, again, the comprehensive list of trainers in California. And if you would like to reach any of our CSU campus um, campuses coordinators, I could provide you with that. And then resources county by county. What we did is we put a package for every, every county for law enforcement because we recognize that at the campuses, the offices close around five o'clock. And let me tell you, your officers, your police force does not end their day at five o'clock. They continue patrolling all 24 hours. So we created packets for all our law enforcement. So if there is a student that might not be meet the AV, you know, the meaning to transport it, they just need a contact. Our officers have that contact of where to refer. 
Another item that we have is a red folder, and I know Taisha will be speaking, but we borrowed, we'd love to borrow from the three, um, two other systems, and the red folder is a folder that we provided every faculty and every staff member in the CSU system, and it's a quick reference guide of how to recognize if a student is having a mental health disorder and where to seek help on campus. So that's something that we provided every faculty, and I have to say that the faculty really enjoy it. There's three products. Um, it's a soft rollout. One of them is a hard copy. Um, so everyone got an actual hard copy. The other one is a desktop icon. So if you're at a CSU, um, you have an icon on your desktop that has that red folder. And then the last product that we're working is an app. And if you are visiting a campus that's not yours, it automatically picks up that local campus with the contact information um, for, the, for the campus. So what, what did the data show? Because that's very critical. So we did do, we surveyed our students um, through Cal Mesa, through the RAND. So RAND, um, all, several of our campuses participated in a RAND study and 7,380 students um, responded. 19% of the students used or received referrals through the counseling services. This is what the students told us. You know, we talked about friends being such a critical piece. Well, that's what we found from the RAND survey, that self and friends were the top sources of referrals. So when students were coming to our centers, that's how they got to our centers, because a friend um, referred them over. And out of those referrals, 71% received services. And the reasons for not assessing the services, the vast majority of the students stated that other than operational issues or poor rep reputation. So it wasn't because our centers were doing anything wrong, it's just that they probably felt that they had their, their own help or they were seeking help outside of the campus. So academic performance impairment by mental health issue. So this is again from the RAND study, these were the findings that most of the, um, it comes from anxiety, 30%. And you could probably see peak times on your campuses, like right before finals, midterms, um, at the beginning of the semester, actually, because for them, they're adjusting. So you could look at when, you know, you need to provide additional services and have more uh, peer groups to go out in the campus and support group students. So we also surveyed the faculty and the staff. And 59% of the faculty reported talking to students about mental health problems at least once in six months prior to the survey. 66% of the faculty staff reported they can identify places or people for referrals. And only 38% believe that they don't have the necessary skills to discuss mental health issues. And that's understandable, but let me share again, that red folder now gives them the, the context of where to refer the student to. So what's next? We recognize that through Cal Mesa, it provided a lot of resources to all 23 campuses, but this is what our steps. We found that there's still gaps, and these are our gaps, and this is what we're trying to do. So we recognize with police training, last year we had our first round of police training. Well, our law enforcement still needs to be trained. So we are doing 12 trainings that begin this Thursday and they're going to be spread out through the entire state of California, from Long Beach, from San Diego, all the way to Sacramento. Our faculty, we heard from our faculty, they need some training, additional training. So QPR meets the needs for our faculty. It's a two hour window. So we are going to have 20, 30 participants become certified trainers. And these slots are available to anyone, not just within the CSU. We open all our trainings to any agency. Another thing that came out of our gaps is that we discovered that, you know, we need to look at our emergency response teams. And we also need to look at our counseling teams. So we are having a meeting next week 
to talk about our procedures when it comes to how do we respond to emergencies and how do we include our counseling teams. And this is actually from the Isla Vista, the, you know, the UC Santa Barbara. And then we had a tragedy last year too, around April. There was a bus going to Chico um, Humboldt State and on their way the students, um, there was a bus accident and we lost several students. They were K through, I mean, they were high school students, but they were still our students. So we have to have a plan because it's not, it's not if it happens, but when it happens. So as a system, we recognize we need to be prepared. Other things that we discovered, peer-to-peer -peer programs. We're gonna have a discussion with the directors, uh, um, the coordinators, to have a look at our standards. You know, we wanna see what are the trainings that are being offered for the peer health educators, and we wanna bring the teams together to do some standards um, throughout the system. And for that, I wanna thank you, and I'll pass this on to Taisha. Good afternoon. I'm going to switch this real quick. Great. So, um, as you heard earlier, my name is Taisha Caldwell, and I am the clinical coordinator and mental health program manager for the UC University of California system. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the UC system, we have uh, 10 campuses, nine traditional undergraduate and graduate campuses, and one um, all professional and graduate schools um, campus. And I work at our central office, Office of the President, which does a lot of policy um, and support to the, provides support for, to the campuses. Just a little background. Um, Anna provided you a really good background about how we all got together and um, under the, under Cal Mesa funding. Um, but we were definitely one of the systems that received funding. Um, and if you want to learn more about Cal Mesa, I would encourage you to visit their website. They post a lot of resources, and you can find out kind of what are the next steps as this initiative moves forward. So in terms of objectives, um, each system did something a little bit different. Um, but UC, um, we focused, well, every, everything was focused on prevention and early intervention. But specifically, we did a lot of work in faculty and staff training, student and peer leader training, suicide prevention, awareness campaigns and social media, statewide collaboration, and evaluation. Um, and I really could talk for hours and hours about all of the work um, that the campuses did in these areas. Um, but I'm going to focus today just on the collaboration piece and kind of what we found to be really meaningful out of that component. Um, Cal Mesa, in their strategic plan, they required all of the recipients to um, utilize, to collaborate with other stakeholders in the state. Um, and what that really provided was an opportunity to work with organizations that maybe you hadn't worked with before. Um, and it also put a little pressure on that we had to report what we did with them <laughs> regularly. And I think, um, I, I will be honest and say this was a little awkward at first. Um, I, you know, I have a counterpart, so Anna's my counterpart in the CSU system. We also have a team at the community college system, and we got together and sat in a room and we're like, well, <laughs> um, there's some collaboration that already existed, but what are we doing? Um, and what I heard from other groups that started collaboration this way was that you just keep meeting. Um, and eventually that relationship starts to form and then something happens. And that's, I would definitely say that's what happened um, with all of us, is that we started meeting, we started talking about what our systems were doing, and then there developed this sense of solidarity and we were all struggling with the same thing. Um, and like I feel like we're in a room now of people that are working to try to meet this demand for mental health. We were all doing that. And then it made it a lot easier to talk about um, how, do we, how do we address those challenges. Um, and I think one thing I can say for sure is that there's a lot of great work happening on all of our campuses. And the focus is always on the shortcomings that we can't meet the need. Um, but there's a lot of great work happening. And I think when you start collaborating, you really have the ability to highlight what's happening and then adopt those practices um, um, on, in other places. So partners that we worked with, um, also the K through 12 education system in California. So there were actually some ways we found to collaborate with them. Um, private colleges and universities, nonprofit organizations, county mental health, 
government agencies. Um, and on that one, I'll say it encouraged me to make some phone calls I probably wouldn't have made before. <laughs> uh, send some emails to different organizations. And I will tell you that the response was overwhelmingly supportive. Um, and we have had multiple agencies step up and provide resources to our system um, just because we reached out to them and kind of talked about what we were, what we were doing. Um, and really the rationale is that there's a sharing of best practices and it's our best chance at maximizing our return on investment um, with funding. Um, we were able to identify trends and address shared challenges without reinventing the wheel. So if the CSU system already dealt with something we're struggling with, why don't we take a look at that first instead of trying to spend a lot of time and resources coming up with something from scratch um, and vice versa. Um, we're able to highlight good work of the staff, which I think, um, which re reportedly is re improving morale. So a lot of the psychologists and other providers on the campuses, they don't get to know what the other campuses are doing, um, but this created an environment where they were able to talk with each other and share and get support. Um, as I said before, we're not duplicating resources. So if the CSU is doing QPR trainings, let's do them together instead of hosting our own. Um, and those are things that we found out were happening that we may not have even known were happening. So I'm gonna go through two examples of just of initiatives that we utilized um, this collaborative approach um, that have made an impact on our system. Um, example number one is where we developed a best, what we consider, I'll say promising practice right now. Um, so we launched the Red Folder Initiative in 2011. Um, and um, as Anna mentioned, this is where there is a folder document for every campus um, that has the signs of distress um, and the campus protocol on what to do if you're interacting with a student that appears to be in distress. Um, there's a flip, uh, not a flip chart, there's a flow chart, is this an emergency, is it not, and who to contact on the campus. Um, each campus, of course, is unique, even though we're trying to, um, to work together. And so it's important that all of these initiatives, we allow the campuses to have to customize everything. So with this initiative, um, we took materials that was already existing on the campuses. Um, and my office developed a template. The campuses could opt to use the template or create their own template um, and develop a resource. So each campus did that. Um, and all 10 are deploying this campaign right now. Collectively, more than 43,000 faculty and staff have been reached. Um, and then as Anna mentioned, um, because we're meeting with the CSU system, they went ahead and adopted this after they saw um, how positively it was being received on our campuses. And I listed a website at the bottom. I have it a couple of times throughout the slides, um, but it's ucop.edu backslash student mental health resources. So all of the materials that we create, we're putting them online. Um, the PDFs for all 10 campus red folders are there. Um, you can get them. There are also contact information for each campus. So if you want an editable version, you can contact them and ask for that. And it's our mission to really provide anybody with the templates for anything that they want. Um, we're also developing these into mobile apps. So you know, you're know you not always in your office with the folder on your desk. Um, and we want this resource to be sustainable. Um, and let me go back to that for a second. OK, we'll keep going. <laughs> Watch the time. Um, in terms of evaluation, and Anna mentioned that we um, were evaluated by the RAND Corporation, so they were hired by CalMesa to do some evaluation. Um, one of their uh, findings in looking at our trainings for faculty and staff was that California's higher education system are associated with, uh, sorry, trainings in our higher education system are associated with confidence with increased confidence and likelihood to intervene with and refer students. And so this is a, a chart that comes out of a study and that's on link to the Cal Mesa website so you can find it if you wanna read the full report. Um, but you see we had really good participation um, in, in this study. And what they found is that um, with our trainings, this faculty and staff were reporting increased confidence to intervene, an increased likelihood that they'll refer an increased likelihood to intervene, um, and an increased likelihood to refer. So not just in the confidence that they'll do it, but that they actually will do it. Um, obviously, we'd like to long-term look at behavioral changes and report of that, um, but these are preliminary, preliminary findings. Um, and these were all significant. 
Um, in terms of our campuses, what they were reporting is that our counseling centers are seeing an increased request for consultation and referrals from faculty and staff, that there is an increased request for the student mental health trainings from academic departments, and that policies and procedures are starting to change. So one campus um, does have this on a mandatory item that's on every, camp, every faculty and staff desktop. Um, others are incorporating it in other ways. And like I mentioned, long term, we want to look at um, increased knowledge of the signs of distress and reportive behavioral changes. So a second example I want to talk about is that we adopted a best practice. Um, so the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention has this interactive screening program. Um, can I see, is anyone familiar with the program? OK, just a couple people. Great, I'll tell you all about it. Um, so this program, it's an online anonymous screening program where you can send targeted emails to students asking them to take a stress and depression questionnaire. Um, they fill it out anonymously and their results are sent to a psychologist on their campus who reviews it and sends them individualized feedback. You know, and the feedback is either saying, hey, it looks like you're doing really, really well. You know, we encourage you to keep you know, up the things you're doing in terms of wellness, um, great. Or if there's some alarming things or suggestive that the student may be struggling, they make recommendations based on the student's responses. Um, the student is then, um, it's not, I won't say a chat feature because it's not immediate, um, but the psychologist responds within 24 hour block to any message the student sends. Um, and they're able to build a relationship with the psychologist who identifies themselves, um, but the student has an option to identify themselves or not. And so they can have this conversation with someone on their campus that cares about them, um, and then decide if they want to open up to them and come in for counseling or treatment. Um, so in terms of nationally, uh, this program um, has, says, uh, some studies have shown that 85% of undergraduates who complete the questionnaire had serious depression or other suicide risk factors, and 90% of those were not receiving treatment. Those who exchanged online messages with the ISP counselor um, were three times more likely than those who did not um, come to an in-person meeting, and three times more likely to enter treatment. And 75% of undergraduates who entered treatment were described by the counselors as not likely to have sought professional help without the ISP. And I thought this is, this is interesting. This is um, very similar to the qualitative report we get back from our, the staff on our campuses. Um, so I wasn't going to call out the campus, but there are directors here, so <laughs> I will. Um, and I will just say, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Reina Juarez, who is the Counseling Center Director at UC San Diego. Um, so, all, yay. <laughs> so all of our campuses adopted this program, and UCSD took an interest in um, doing some research and trying, figuring out how to make the program more effective. Um, I will say some key components of this is that you get to send a targeted email to a student, they fill it out, um, and they opt in for contact or not. Um, UCSD looked at um, the approach to that initial contact, um, identifying the target population, who do you send it out to first and in what order, um, obtaining support from the campus and getting that buy-in, and then coordination with campus partners. Um, and, what, and they compared it to another campus of ours that was using the standard method that AFSP, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, provided in terms of how to administer the program. So campus one is the standard way of delivering the program. Um, and with that, um, you're getting about a 5.7% response to the student actually taking the survey. Um, and that's actually the around a national average for this, for this survey. After UCSD implemented a bunch of changes <laughs> that they found from a study they did, they increased their response to 13.6%. And that's huge. <laughs> um, and we're look yeah, so I'll say that. They also then surveyed the community that they sent the email to. So whether or not the student responded, they surveyed the people that um, received the email asking them to take it. And they asked questions like, how did the program affect your impression of counseling services? And overwhelmingly, it was positive or neutral or no change and very little negative impact. They looked at overall how the program affected their likelihood to seek counseling services. It increased some, uh, others were neutral and very little less likely. Um, and almost everybody <laughs> would recommend the program and nobody definitely wouldn't recommend the program. And so the fact that they did this study allowed us to assess if we wanted to continue to invest in this program or if we should try something else, if it was, if it was of value. 
Um, so um, I will say that all of our campuses opted to continue this program, which is huge, because I don't know about you, but when do 10 campuses agree to do something <laughs> at the same time? Um, but I think everybody universally saw the value of, of what was happening. Um, and instead of having 10 campuses trying to assess it, we have one campus doing it and then sharing those results with everybody and, and then moving forward from there. Um, so with this addition um, to our tools on campus, we've screened over 80,000 students for suicide and depression over the two years that we've used it. Um, approximately 34, and that's 34% of our student body. Um, the cost of the program is a $5,000 initial payment and then $2,500 a year. Um, and I will say that local AFSP chapters um, provided the funding for the first three years of this program. And that's something that they try to do for every campus that wants to start. So this was relatively low cost for the bang that we got <laughs> out of it. Um, so that's just an example really about how you can adopt best practices and then transform them to fit your needs, as well as you can develop your own best practices and then share them. Um, other programs and initiatives that we've done can be found on our website, and I listed it here again. Um, and then I will just also note that UC is really interested in formalizing and expanding our collaborative relationships um, even further. And, and so if you're interested in that, we'll definitely be in touch. I would encourage you to sign up for um, the mailing list on our website so you can stay in the loop, um, considering a conference coming up um, to bring people together. And I will then, uh, I'm gonna stop there and turn it over. Thank you so much. Thank you. So now we're gonna turn it over to our two commenters and uh, Viviana, if you would. Yeah, um, so hi everyone. I'm here to talk about um, a program that I started when I was an undergraduate at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, and I graduated in 2014. Um, so this is basically just sort of a student response to the same sort of issues that we've been talking about today. Um, and our goal was really to sort of change the campus climate and make it um, a safe place for people with mental illnesses. Um, so Rethink Psychiatric Illness is a student organization and our goals are to raise awareness about mental illnesses and also to increase help seeking behaviors among students. Um, and our main project is a four hour student led training where we basically teach people what our mental illness is, and how can you be an advocate? How can you access resources? Um, so we've been talking about today how, you know, college students are sort of faced with this dilemma. Suicide is the second leading cause of death on college campuses. Um, and NAMI has done some studies where we know that about half of students report receiving no education on mental health before they come to campus, and then half of them don't receive any education once they're on campus. So basically we're in a situation where as students, we are being called to act, yet we don't know how. No one has told us what we're supposed to do. Um, and that's basically the, the gap that Rethink is trying to fill. Um, so I co-founded Rethink with my really good childhood friend, Stephanie Nieves, um, when we were sophomores at UNC. And it really grew out of sort of a sense of isolation that we felt. Um, we came up with the idea when we were freshmen. So um, when we came to campus and we weren't you know, with our families anymore and our friends who sort of knew and understood our experiences, um, we often felt lonely because we both have people who we love who have mental illnesses. And um, you know, oftentimes that can sort of feel like you're hiding or you can't share or to respect that person's privacy, you're sort of alone with your experiences. And we, we figured that that was probably the case for other students and we wanted to do something about it. Um, and we often experience issues where people would say things like, oh, the weather's so bipolar or you know, this professor was acting schizophrenic and these are comments that can be isolating and hurtful and people don't say them with bad intentions, they just don't know. So how do we make sure that people do know, right? And that's why we started our program. Um, we got funding from the Johnson Center for Undergraduate Excellence as part of a sort of special residential program where you live with a group of students, you propose an original project, and you sort of carry it out that year. So Stephanie and I were mentors. Um, one of the students there was Taylor Swanky, who's currently um, our co-chair at UNC and was one of uh, the sort of founders of the group. Um, and we basically got, got money to, to get that done. Um, our pilot program was on March 17, 2011. Um, and it was a huge, massive success. We had a lot of people come, and from there, we sort of grew the organization because we saw that there was a lot of interest. 
So we applied to be a committee of UNC Center for Social Justice, um, and we got that, and now we are an official student organization. We have 501c3 status, and we've trained over 540 students. Um, yeah, which is really incredible. Um, and so I, I think I'm gonna go into a little bit of what exactly the training is, right? Um, it's student-led, so we have three student facilitators that go through a sort of workshop, um, series of workshops where we teach them kind of how to, to do that role. Um, they're four hours and we can accommodate from 15 to 30 students in each training. Um, we start off with sort of group agreements, confidentiality is a big thing for us so that people can feel open to share their experiences. Um, we start off with a sort of myth fact activity where we um, sort of uh, will put out statements and then students have to decide whether or not they're true or false and we discuss what are the misconceptions and stigma that, that led us to believe something um, erroneously. Um, then we give an overview of what mental illnesses are, um, the causes, and then information on sort of the most common ones, so like bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, eating disorders, substance abuse. Um, then after that, we talk about what stigma is, and we've included um, information on what ableism is, what disability, um, what disability means, and sort of trying to be more deliberately intersectional in that, in that section where we talk about how um, people have overlapping identities and how your experience as someone with a mental illness can be impacted um, by your experience as someone who belongs to a sexual minority or um, a racial minority. Um, and then after that, we have sort of more interactive activities. Um, one of them, we ask students to, um, we divide up the room into sort of yes and no, and we read out different statements like, for example, um, I am close to someone who has ADHD. And if you identify yes, you go to one side, no, the other side. And this activity is usually really exciting for people because they notice like, hey, a lot of people are going to the yes side. And I thought that I was the only one. Um, so that's a really great activity. We also have at each training a UNC student share their personal story with mental illness. So they'll talk about their own experiences and that really helps give a face to the issue. Um, after that, we focus a lot on access to resources. So um, what, where on campus can I get help? Uh, we talk to them a lot about their Americans with Disabilities Rights, at, um, the ADA rights that they have. A lot of them had never even heard of reasonable accommodations before our training um, and didn't even know that sort of mental illnesses were considered disability and they had legal rights. Um, so we'll talk about that, um, counseling and wellness and all the sort of services that UNC gives. Um, and at the end of each training, students will get a placard that they put on their door in the dorm rooms. And this is sort of a really powerful way to increase visibility on campus, because the, the placard will say, you know, I am committed to ending mental health stigma, I went to a training. And imagine as a first year student, you're sort of walking down the hallway and you see that and you're like, you know, I'm not alone, my neighbor cares about things that affect me. Um, so that's really been huge for us as well. Um, and then I thought it, it could be important to sort of talk about how, you know, our, our program has been really successful and everything's gone really well, but, you know, it wasn't without its sort of roadblocks um, in the beginning. I think that oftentimes administrators um, can be sort of scared of, of all the potential liabilities that are involved with different, with different programs. And this one is student-led, so it sort of seemed risky to administrators at first. Um, and I remember like just a couple days before our first training having um, what at the time was a rather intimidating meeting um, with Counseling and Wellness and the Office of the Dean of Students. And they've actually been great partners. Um, and it was a, a, a good meeting where they sort of talked about what their concerns were. We took those into consideration because of course it's really important to us too to make sure that the students are safe. And we ended up um, sort of reaching a, a great agreement. But in the, in the beginning, they, they really wanted to encourage us to, to postpone. Um, and I, I'd rather, like, I'd like to challenge administrators in the room to sort of think about how, in reality, I think that the, the real danger is not to talk about mental health, not the way, the other way around. Um, and so we've sort of uh, learned from that experience how to, how to build um, relationships and alliances with our school, and UNC's been really supportive. In fact, um, we got the Diversity Award for Student Organization that same year um, from the Office of Diversity and Multicultural Affairs. So they really have um, had our back since. Um, 
And to talk about some of the sort of outcomes um, at UNC, since UNC, um, since Rethink has been a student organization, we really noticed that mental health has become something that is, is more talked about. Um, we've had incredible reach in terms of attendance at our trainings, um, and we've had sort of informal surveys that we've done throughout the process of revising our curriculum and making sure that, that what we're doing is working. Um, and we've had really great results where we'll ask students true or false questions about mental health before the training and then a week after. Um, and we'll find that they, they learn things like, um, you know, asking about suicide doesn't actually put the idea in the person's mind. Actually, I should ask about it and this is how I should do it. Um, and so we've had good results thus far and our, our goal is to, um, once we're sort of done with our finalized training, um, to have a more formal um, data that proves um, that our program really, really works. Um, but we've built coalitions. There's now a group called Stigma Free Carolina that we are a part of. Um, we've, uh, we've seen an increase in sort of people who access um, counseling and wellness services at UNC. And of course, we can't take full credit for that, but we do think that it's been a result of sort of this conversation increasing. Um, we've also had a lot of um, sort of increased interest in our program, and we've done a lot of specialized sort of one-hour trainings for high school students, ROTC, um, for we went to East Carolina University and did a full training for their graduate students. So we've had a lot of interest in our program, um, and it's been very valuable for a number of different groups. Um, and then on top of our trainings, Rethink also does a lot of sort of awareness events and community building events on campus because for us it's really important that the sort of initial spark for starting the program, which was we don't want people to feel alone, that we continue to foster that and make sure that our program is sort of a family for people and, um, and a source of support. So we've had like a flash mob on campus. We write letters to strangers on Valentine's Day. Um, and, and we do, uh, we also have a lot of events where we sort of put people together and talk about, um, again, intersectionality. We had an event on African-American mental health, um, an event where we talked about who's left out of our conversations on eating disorders. Um, and sort of this kind of thing really helps students feel like they're part of a family and they're not alone. Um, and I'm happy to answer any more questions about it um, afterward, but I, I wanted to sort of end with an anecdote, which um, at one of our, our Rethink trainings, we always have icebreakers and, and that day, um, my coaches and I were feeling like a little silly and, and sort of, um, you know, a little mushy. And so we asked everyone to say, you know, what is your favorite thing about Rethink? Um, and every single person said, it's a family. I have friends here, I have support. When I'm going through a bad day and I say I'm having a bad day, people here know what that means. Um, and that just meant the world to us because ultimately that's what we wanted, right, is to, is to make sure that, that people felt supported. Viviana, Viviana, that was very, very nice. And uh, to think you, you did that all as an undergraduate. It's just hard to believe that you're not a Trojan, actually. <laughs> and I'm actually even more saddened to know that you're at NYU and not USC because we would love to have amazing, amazing citizens like you here. Thank you so but it's much. too late, but you know, maybe you'll want to come back with outstanding program. Thank you. And so next, uh, Danielle, uh, fellow veteran, um, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Hi, everyone. Uh, I just first want to say that I'm very honored to be here today. Uh, I'm kind of going to expand on a little more about veteran issues that we've been experiencing at our college. Uh, to give you a little background about me, I'm, uh, I served in the Marine Corps from 2004 to 2009. I uh, did three deployments to Iraq. Um, I actually, my last deployment, I actually did a 13-month deployment, and a month later I was at a college campus, so at American River College, where I now work. Um, this is the scenario that we're seeing with a lot of our veterans as they are returning back home uh, from doing multiple deployments and uh, having all these transitional issues. So I kind of wanted to talk about the support systems that we have in place at our, uh, at our college. Uh, we do have now, um, we adopted a one-stop shop model at our Veterans Resource Center that actually carries all our services into one area. So, uh, some of the services that we uh, actually provide are as our counseling services. We have our educational uh, VA counselors inside our center. Uh, we provide uh, mental health counseling uh, through our vet center. Uh, the vet center was kind of mentioned earlier. The vet center is kind of separate from, it's a, they're all over the country pretty much. They provide readjustment counseling for veterans and it's a free service. So they're actually in our, in our offices actually providing counseling for our veterans as they come in. Um, another thing we have is our uh, disabled students program services counselors that provide accommodations for our vets right in our center. 
You know, a lot of veterans, when you see them, you know, a lot of us are afraid to seek out help. It's just our mentality because we're so used to being out in the field and having to uh, be our own leaders. We're, we serve in leadership roles based off our jobs that we do. So to be able to actually seek out help is a very difficult thing. But um, so they're not, they don't want to go over to our dis, disabled student program services because the, that word disabled is in that, in that label. They don't want, we don't like to be labeled that, so don't, they don't seek out the help. So what we did, we actually put the counselor into our center so, but the, the counselor approaches it in a different manner to where they're, you know, they're going to see them to actually get an uh, plan done. But at the same time, the counselor will talk them up to actually, hey, you can, do you know you can get accommodations for this if you have this disability? And it kind of helped them out in that manner. Um, another big program that we have is our uh, Vets Assess on Campus program. You know, uh, we apply for that program to the VA. It's when the VA permanently pay, places a uh, vocational rehab counselor at our, at our campus. We're the only school in Northern California that has that program. Um, we've been so lucky to have that program in, at our campus because uh, the person that's a counselor there is actually a, a retired Air Force veteran himself, and he really helps. And anything VA related, he can actually talk to talk to the veteran. He's also in our center as well. So uh, you know, and then of course our peer mentorship program with our veterans. We have 12 uh, veteran work studies in our program. All of all of them, we have two dependents as well and 10 veterans. And about all 10 of them have been deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, the, what I've seen in, the, in our center is a lot of veterans coming in uh, being frustrated with the process because they not only have to deal with the application process and the matriculation steps to get into the college, they also have to deal with the VA bureaucracy trying to use their benefits so, and financial aid and all that. So on top of all the paperwork, it's, it can get very frustrating. But as soon as they come into the center and they see a, a person at the counter, you can see that they're frustrated. But once that, that veteran at the, our staff member at the counter discloses that they're a veteran too, and they, they know the process, they're using benefits at this college as well, you can see the weight just drop off their shoulders. Um, that's why it's so important, you know, you talk about friendship and peer mentorship, um, having those, those veterans in our office actually helping the other veterans adjust back and try to transition back into, um, you know, into back into being a student. Um, you know, another thing we do is actually do faculty and staff training. You know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, faculty staff is not aware of the military culture you know, and kind of, you know, our, and kind of the issues that, that, are, that are going on with veterans. So we try to do trainings on campus. We had a welcome home training um, last semester. We had over 100 participants in that, um, along with a student panel. Because we rather, you know, student panels are very successful because, you know, they're hearing from the veterans outright what the issues are, what they're experiencing in the classroom. Um, another thing we have on, in our office, we do have CalVet coming in to actually discuss about the state benefits. Because there there's federal benefits, but there's also state benefits as well. Um, our certifying officials are also in our center. They also process the benefits in there. So, you know, this one-stop shop model is very important. Um, and I think a lot of colleges that do have uh, high VIP populations should have a Veterans Resource Center at their campus and kind of, you know, in develop this model to actually implement it, to actually get the help so veterans are actually getting the help that they need as they transition back. Um, another thing we do is we're starting up, we're going to do veterans orientations, specifically just for veterans, to kind of ease the process over as they're trying to transition back to the college. And you know, it's, I just, it's just been a long road for a lot of our vets, and especially for me. Um, you know, I made the transition. Uh, I still struggle with my issues as well. When I got back, I was diagnosed with PTSD as soon, immediately once I started off on campus after my third deployment. And uh, you know, it's been, a, it's been a long road, and there's issues that I, I have to deal with and I see with other, with other veterans that I'm actually able to discuss. But you know, now I'm in my master's program now at, at Sac State, getting in my master's in counseling. So I definitely can let them know that, hey, I definitely have been through where you what you've been going through, and I can definitely relate. But there's there's you know, there's a way that you can be successful, and I, I I'm, I'm proof that you can actually do that. Um, you know, it's it's kind of our campus is really expanding our services out to so much of our so many of our veterans, and uh, working with our different uh, campuses at, all throughout the community. Um, we we hold actually regional meetings um, at our campus. Uh, we've hold, held about three now. At, at my college, where we invite all the different uh, veterans counselors and VA certifying officials to our campus, and we discuss best practices and how we can help each other out and actually develop programs. Um, you know, and it's sure, basically to take our ideas that we have on our campus and how you can use it at your campus. Uh, last semester when I had, I had 26 schools in attendance, including CSUs and UCs and community colleges all over from Northern California. And it was just a major success to actually see everyone willing to come out and actually come together as a whole and try to determine what the best practices are. And because I'm, I'm all for the call, different colleges actually having these services, but I'm also trying to focus on the community as well and try to, how can we help our veterans that are coming out, gonna be coming out of the military? Um, a stat that, the, that CalVet came out with, um, 
with the downsizing of the troops in Afghanistan and also um, with the you know, downsizing of the military and also the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan, um, we're going to see uh, 30,000 veterans for the next seven years come to California alone. And many of them start off at the community college because a lot of them do not, have never attended college before and they don't have the requirements uh, that allow them to transfer over to the UC or CSU yet. Um, and most veterans, to be honest with you, come off to the community colleges before they even step foot at a VA healthcare facility to seek, seek help. Because they, you know, when they, whenever they get out, they actually are losing everything. They lose their benefits. If they have a family, they no longer have insurance. So how is, you know, when we looked at it along with my, uh, you know, my, my deans and whatnot, kind of discussed how can we help them out with this transition? How can we provide these services to help them? Because they're coming on brand new. A lot of them seek out the user GI Bill because that's the only funding that they're going to get while they're in, while they're in this college. They don't have any job yet. That's, that's the money they're going to use to pay rent and to provide for the families is using their GI Bill. So we did try to decide how we can better provide our services for veterans, but not only veterans, but also their families. You know, the families are there along the way in supporting them and, ha and having to deal with the issues as well. So our, our uh, center is actually open to all our veterans. Um, you know, we have about 900 veterans using benefits at our college, about 1,500 at our, at our campus. Uh, some, of, uh, some of them, those are ones that we've seen that identified themselves coming in, um, trying to seek out. So we open up our center to all of them to actually come in and we actually provide services for all of them um, and answer any questions. Um, you know, a big thing for me that I tell my staff as well is getting, getting uh, used to the campus resources and also the community resources that, that know the name of that person at each, each area. You know, a lot of, a lot of people, get, not just veterans, but also um, non-veterans students get frustrated when they go to an area that they don't know anyone at. So what I do is try to make sure that they, that, that they know a name where they could properly refer them out to. That way you're just telling that person that veteran that, hey, go see this individual here and give them a name. So when they go out there, they can ask for them because they know they're gonna get help. Instead of having to go to that area and actually be like, and not get so frustrated with because they're not knowing who to go to. So I always look for, tell my staff to actually get familiar with that so you know who to make the referral to and by name know who they are. And that, and that helps out so many of our veterans that be able to do that. Um, you know, it's, it's, been, it's been a long road. We only had our center for about a year now. And uh, we've, since, since, since summer, since we've been tracking our data, we've had over 3,000 visits to our center, uh, in, just over since summer 14 to now. So that's a big number for us to actually see that the Veteran Resource Center is, is working. Um, and, and it comes to that mentality where when you, if you build it, it will come, they will come pretty much. And that's what's, that's what's, what's happened at our campus is that they're coming in to use, utilize the services. And many of them are coming not only for our programs because of the services that we offer to our campus. You know, it's, it's kind of heartbreaking to, for me. You know, whenever I speak to other veterans is that they come up to me and ask me, um, you know, they, they question whether the service to the country, does any, anyone even recognize it? And it just breaks my heart whenever I hear, that, hear that, uh, that they tell me that. But I tell them all the time, you know, look, we have a center here now, and that's proof that someone, someone on this campus, campus actually cares about you. So those are come some of the stuff that we do at our, at our campus. Um, and definitely, we're going to be expanding our program out and uh, hopefully do better now for the, for, as we uh, try to help our veterans transition back to mil uh, from the military to, to becoming students, pretty much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Daniel. And, and for those of you who think about veterans in a different way, uh, think about Daniel. Um, Daniel is a great citizen, is doing great things, and is what I call a multiplier effect. When another veteran can help another veteran who then will help another veteran. When you think about a veteran and you only think of them as PTSD or TBI, these men and women are still able to function at a very high level. Uh, just because you have a diagnosis doesn't mean it stops you from being very successful. Um, we just have a, a bumpy road sometimes coming home. But David and the others are great examples of people who admittedly talk about an illness, but yet are strong, resilient, and continue to do great things for us as American citizens. So thank you, Daniel, and thanks to all the veterans in the room. Um, I do have about 10 minutes. And by the way, I have to thank my panelists, all of you, for being on time. Every one of them landed exactly on time as if we scripted this out perfectly. <laughs> So thank you all. So we do have about 10 minutes for questions, um, and we have the answers. I have a question here, uh, or a statement. Uh, my, I'm from Southern California, and my son went to San Francisco State in, uh, at 18 a couple of years ago and blew out, um, kind of typical. 
isolate, and they became isolated and uh, paranoid and hallucinating. And then we went on this sort of uh, bizarre uh, psychiatric journey of diagnoses, meds, and uh, so forth. It's, to say the least, it was a nightmare. But then uh, last summer, uh, a friend of his uh, told him actually he was smoking pot um, daily for extensively. And then we focused in on his uh, drug use and put it, threw him in wilderness for six months against his will, and gee, what happened? All of his symptoms went away. So I think, um, I think the elephant in the room you might want to consider is that drugs and alcohol are an epidemic on every campus, including this one. And you might want to ask a simple question when somebody has uh, mental illness symptoms. Are you using drugs? What kind of drugs? What quantity of drugs? That might give you a different approach than just looking at the symptoms and saying they're mentally ill. And I'd also encourage every college campus in America to think of drug-free housing. There is only um, less than 20 campuses across the country that acknowledge the drug problem and actually addressing it with a drug-free problem. So I really don't have a question, but that was my comment. Thank you. Thank you. I, first of all, I wanted to you know, commend all of you for being proactive on these issues and not just reacting to emergencies. It's nice to see, particularly, frankly, governmental agencies trying to be out and be out in front. Um, my question is this. There's lots of statistics that you put up with regard to numbers of people that have been reached, particularly for the, for the main speakers. And my question is, are there any statistics with regard to the effectiveness of these programs, uh, reduced suicide attempts, reduced arrests, um, reduced emergency interventions, those sorts of things that measure the effectiveness or the programs that you've been implementing. Yeah. Thank you. Am I on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, and I would say that yes, we're collecting that data, but these those I, those are long term outcomes as we're looking at them. So as you know, immediately when we started implementing prevention and early intervention programs, we started seeing increases in report and everything. Um, and some could look at that and say, oh, it's not working. More students are you know, coming in in distress. Um, but we think we're accessing or we're reaching people that students that wouldn't have normally sought out those services. Um, so we're seeing a spike and we are tracking those trends and we hope to be able to um, produce a report and report on what are the long-term outcomes. Um, at this point, our evaluators um, are feeling like that there was, we're not at a stage to comment on the reduction just yet, um, but we're there. Um, and I will say that um, our system is working on an evaluation plan um, where we're developing an annual system um, where we're collecting that data from all of our campuses every year. Um, and that way, moving forward, we'll be able to say what happened five years ago versus what happened today. Um, so we're, yeah. And I will also, I guess I'll also tie in just um, the comment about the, the drugs and alcohol um, and be able to say that um, our campuses are also working on a collegiate, in the, co the collegiate recovery movement, um, which is, provides um, campus programs for students that are living in recovery on our campuses. And so colleges are looked at as not a very safe place for students that are in, living in recovery. Um, and so we recently trained a bunch of student leaders and staff advisors from all three systems um, to develop those programs on their campuses. And those have launched in the last year or two, and we're collecting data on those as well. Um, so I'll turn it over. Anna has a comment. When it, comes to, when it comes to numbers, that's really a hard number to collect. It's something that does come up time and time again around the number of suicides. I think once we have one loss, it doesn't matter how many more losses because we already lost a student. Um, our campus police are the ones that collect that number for the CSU system. And, you know, it's a hard number just because sometimes the student goes back home and the family doesn't report it as a suicide. So we normally just look at the incidents on our campuses. Uh, but it's something that we know it's on the radar and we do always get questioned what are the numbers. Um, all we, through this Cal Mesa effort, has been a lot of prevention work that we're trying to do. We're trying to reach out groups that we feel might um, m might be more successful, um, 
success, I guess, in, in providing the services. Um, like we mentioned, veterans programs, um, the LGBTQ programs, I mean, um, the foster youth. So we try to make sure that when we reached out through Cal Mesa, the campuses are reaching out to special populations. Um, and again, it's, it's a hard number. And what we try to accomplish through Cal Mesa more, more short term, but as a campus has recognized that, you know, there are things that we still have to work on. And that's kind of what I mentioned. There's still gaps in the system. And all we could do is bring people together, look at what campuses have strong programs and the campuses that might need a little bit more support we're able to provide that support, and Cal Mesa was able to help us with that. Um, regarding also the comment, um, the CSU, actually in the next two weeks, we're gonna have an alcohol tobacco conference in Monterey Bay, something that we've been doing as a system for several years now. And at every campus, we do have an alcohol coordinator, and they provide different um, support systems. And I'm excited to share that some of our campuses have actually brought into um, organizations that either have office space within the counseling centers to support students that are struggling with substance abuse. And if you were to ever go through a mental health first aid training, that is one of the topics that we do cover in mental health first aid, is that um, there's also the drug abuse that causes the mental health disorders. So I just wanna share that. I just had a comment as well. So when you think about evaluation and the way you're thinking about it, most funders aren't willing to fund the level of evaluation that you and I would like to see in terms of comparative kind of studies or is this better than something else? Uh, what are the real outcomes? That, that design is, can be costly and many, many of the funds that you, you'll see from our, from our state and county aren't willing to step up and offer that level of funding for those types of evaluations. And then finally, if you notice, most of the evaluations done that really can show outcome are those that are done in tertiary care uh, there's not enough emphasis and funding for us to do evaluation in the prevention and early intervention, and it's always a little bit more difficult. So I'm not making excuses. I'm just saying reality on the ground is that many times it's very hard to measure these, especially when the only thing that they want to know is how many people have you trained. So. I'm going to repeat your question. You said how good is the baseline data? Um, I will say for our system, the baseline data um, is not that good. Um, so, you know, we receive, you receive funding and there's an expectation that you start collecting um, the evaluations. Um, we, you know, we do the best that we can. Um, but, yeah, I think so. We created a baseline, but it's not a true baseline. Um, so, in moving, and that partly um, influences why there's not enough data to uh, to show long-term effects at this point. Um, so we're hoping, you know, get it when you can, and then as we move forward, eventually we'll have something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we have five minutes. Can I make a comment? Um, following up on, I think, the first speaker, I think what would be really useful to, maybe in the future, is to get more specific about what the interventions are, because the discussion so far is at a very general level. Treatment is not, that doesn't tell you a lot. Um, programs, that doesn't tell you a lot. A training doesn't tell you a lot. I'm on the psychology faculty here, so forgive me if I'm a little anal on this, but I'm also a clinical psychologist, so I live in the real world too. There are a lot of theories and a lot of techniques and a lot of research that indicates what best practices might be. It's not as easily arrived at as we might think. Um, that go to questions about what is mental illness, what are the causes of disorders. We are very far from understanding what the causes of most of these disorders are. So to teach what the causes are runs the risk of teaching the wrong things. The fact that things are in place doesn't mean <clears throat> that they're the best way to do, to do it. And I've been part of the problem as well as trying to be part of the um, solution. A comment on suicide being uh, the most frequent cause of death among college students, that's, pro that's no, probably true, if not one, but maybe second. But you have to keep in mind, you're comparing it to a healthy group of young people who are usually spared the kinds of illnesses that create mortality, morbidity, and mortality later in life. 
So it's not really, with all respect, very enlightening to say that suicide is a frequent cause of death. It is, but, but what you draw from that is different from what you may want to draw from it. Um, the, the last thing I'll say is, is that, uh, well, maybe I've already said it. Oh, one last thing. Um, you've been flirting with this at different times. The last speaker, you commented on the VA and the problems with the VA and trying to change an institute, well, to try to change the VA is, is like trying to, to turn 10 ocean liners with two small tugboats, as you know better than I do. So in a way, we're sometimes caught in a bind of trying to change individuals to adjust to a very undesirable and possibly noxious social, institutional, organizational environment and on the one hand. On the other hand, there's the, the choice any helper has to make and how much time and effort to spend on at what used to be called community psychology at the level of organizations and institutional, societal, and cultural values to change at that point. Because you can look at students, for example, who suffer from anxiety and depression at high-powered universities. And you can add in faculty and staff for that matter. And how do you deal with this? Do you teach them, do you give, offer them meditation training, which a lot of campuses are they're jumping on the mindfulness bandwagon? That may do some people some good, but let's keep in mind that what you're really doing is teaching adjustment to what might be oppressive conditions. And, and I see this institute, the Sachs Institute, particularly wanting to draw that distinction because if you look at the name of the institute, it has to talk about policy and ethics. And these are things that require a, a macro view of things as well as an individual view of things. So those are just my, my comments. Well, thank you so much, and uh, we're going to wrap it up. So thank you so much. Please give them a round of applause.